Hello and welcome to the last Rosetta Hangout before this incredible mission is set to make its dramatic conclusion. After two years living with Comet 67P CG, in just 11 days time the spacecraft is set to make a controlled descent onto the surface of the comet. My name is Emily Baldwin, I'm Space Science Editor here at ESTEC, um, ESA's technical heart in the Netherlands, and I'm hosting today's Hangout. I'm very happy to be joined by four of our ESA experts today who are ready to answer your questions about Rosetta's final adventure. From ESA's Mission Control Center in Darmstadt, Germany, then I'm very happy to be joined by Andrea Akamazzo, ESA's Flight Operations Director, and Sylvain Lodio, Rosetta's Spacecraft Operations Manager. Thanks for joining. And from ESAC, the European Space Astronomy Center near Madrid in Spain, it's a pleasure to welcome Claire Vallat, Rosetta Science Ground Segment Liaison Scientist and Lawrence O'Rourke, Rosetta's Downlink Science Operations Manager and also the man behind the scenes of coordinating Philae's uh, search campaign that you may have heard about in recent weeks. Before we get started, just a reminder that you can ask our guests um, questions via Twitter using the hashtag AskESA and you can also post them in the comments section here in YouTube Live. If you're a journalist, then please also do let us know your affiliation. So I would like to start by asking Andrea, on behalf of thousands of concerned Rosetta mission fans who've been messaging us in the last weeks and months, why do we have to end the mission now? And why in particular do we have to land by, end the mission by crashing on the comet? Well, I like saying something. We are ending part of the mission. We are coming to the end of the flight segment of the space segment, if you want, of the mission. The mission is much more than just the, just the spacecraft. We'll have data collected that we'll have to exploit for decades. But the spacecraft has come to a point in orbit that uh, it's difficult to continue operations and we had to, to make a decision here. We could have followed the comet further in its orbit, but we would have flown further away from the sun. So we wouldn't, our solar panels wouldn't be able to generate enough power to keep the spacecraft alive. We could have abandoned the spacecraft as well, but this is not what we, we want to do. So we are coming now at the end of September to the last point where we can safely operate the scientific instruments. And we've decided that there wouldn't be a better end for Rosetta space segment than depositing the spacecraft on the surface of the comet. And this is what we are going to do. Operating Rosetta beyond this point wouldn't be possible. And Sylvan, how has the spacecraft been performing in the last weeks? If you could unmute your microphone as well. Thank you. Sorry, uh, I forgot. Um, so yes, the spacecraft has been doing remarkably well, I must say. So it's going, going very, very smoothly. We have a few issues, of course, here and there with the instruments, uh, also with the spacecraft, but globally, everything is really, really fine. We're um, doing these, this flyover phase. So um, every three days, we're flying closer and closer to the comet. We've reached a distance of 3.9 kilometers from the center, so about 1.9 kilometers from the surface a few weeks ago. Had to retract to 4.1 kilometers because on, on ground we're really um, facing a big challenge in navigating the, the spacecraft and predicting the, uh, the, how the orbits would look like. Because every time we fly over, we get a, a kick and it's very, very difficult to model. So that's been a, a big challenge here for my colleagues from Flight Dynamics. But otherwise, yeah. globally, we're doing fine. Good to hear. And in fact, the, the issue you mentioned of flying very close to the comet uh, was illustrated quite nicely in the, the by now quite famous picture of Philae. Um, I think once people probably got over the surprise of seeing just how clear Philae looked in that image, some people have noticed that actually the Philae is right over on the right hand side of that image. And it's these kind of uh, issues that you mentioned that we're making a challenge for images like these to be collected. Is that right, Larry? Yeah, that's right. I mean, the, the reality is we've been looking at that location for, for a number of months now. We, we've seen so a light shining in the darkness. We believe that to be Philae. So this, this, this um, opportunity on the 2nd of September, uh, we had, in fact, the lander uh, right in the center of field of view. But it's, it's because of this kick, because we're flying so close, the gravity uh, changes and produces an off pointing uh, similarly, there's a certain gas drag as well, and all of this le led to the to the lander being being let's say the, the center of the of where the lander should have been. In fact, the lander was pushed to the side, but we got it. That's the most important thing. So it was a pretty lucky shot. Well, it's certainly a very lucky shot, especially if you imagine that the the opportunity before that, the 30th of August, we it was just outside the field of view, it was it was pushed completely outside the images, and 
and the one just after that on the 5th of September we we also missed it so in 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 fact this image that was that was that was shown is the last image uh, that we had planned and that, that actually was executed successfully for for the land search so of course we're delighted yeah and it's a nice end to have been able to find file so close to the end of Rosetta's mission of course we're talking about Rosetta's landing today but people are still very very curious to know if Rosetta will be able to see file during her descent to the surface no there's no there's no real hope I mean to to take a good image of file you have to be below 10 kilometers and already below 15 kilometers we're looking at our, our impact site and, and I think this is the most important thing to say we we have our image of file uh, the focus now on the end of mission is is to get those images of the the most uh, these fabulous pits the the map pits and speaking of the map pits claire you're part of the team that's planning some of the the science operations that rosetta will be doing in these final weeks tell us how do you even go about planning something like this particularly with the uncertainties that sylvan and, and larry have mentioned with respect to flying so close to the comet well, uh, this is this is a very complex process. So of course, there is um, some alternative scenario that has been worked that are being worked on in parallel, just to make sure that we uh, we we see all uh, possible scenario and we are able to face them. Um, for some of the instruments uh, that will be operating uh, in a regular way uh, all along the descent, uh, it's going to be a roughly a scenario that will be the same uh, in all cases. Uh, and this is uh, this is an extraordinary uh, opportunity for for Rosetta to uh, to study some this region that uh, we've never uh, investigated before from so close. So, especially for the in situ instrument uh, that will be studying this uh, region around the nucleus, like the acceleration region where the dust gets uh, accelerated by the gas. Uh, this is of prime importance to make to be able to to make measurement from this region uh, by being directly within this region. And uh, apart from this, we will also study, of course, the, uh, uh, the morphology of, uh, of uh, the surface, especially the mat pits, as uh, Larry was mentioning, which is a uh, um, very, very important, um, uh, let's say, area to study to uh, better understand how the activity develops uh, on the comet. Uh, and apart from this, we will also have some uh, some study from the from the plasma instrument uh, that will be studying the the solar wind interaction with the with the bare nucleus when it becomes more inactive. And uh, also, there will be, of course, all the remote sensing observation from the surface uh, with an unprecedented resolution. So it's uh, it's a very very exciting part of the mission. Maybe one of the most exciting part of the mission. I would so it sounds like a, pretty much all of the Rosetta Science instruments will be operating in that phase. Is that true, or will it be primarily, uh, say, for example, images versus gas collection, or how is how is the schedule looking so far? Uh, well, so far, uh, all instruments will be uh, will be working except three of them: so Midas and Cosima, the dust instrument, uh, and also Vertis, uh, the infrared spectrometer, will not be uh, be working. Um, but all the rest, uh, either partially, like Rosina, which will be operating with two of uh, uh, three, uh, two uh, of the, uh, its three sensors, um, all the rest will be operating. Yes. So we are really trying to get an as complete picture as possible uh, of this uh, this region. Exciting times. So Van, talk us through the key timings of. Uh, of the day, perhaps uh, in, even in the day before, if there are spacecraft operations taking place. Okay, so yeah, so we, we have two more flyovers. This will lead us to uh, Sunday this week, and then we have to phase out to basically be able to reach the point uh, where we'll be able to do a maneuver, which will then bring us in collision course with the um, with the comet. So this this final maneuver will happen in, in the night from the 29th to the 30th of, uh, of September. And um, yeah, and then basically it will be just descending towards the comet for 14 hours. And as a, an interesting question from somebody on uh, from Facebook, Pierre Arpin, he asks, uh, could Rosetta be pushed back into space before it lands due to a strong and predicted jet from the pits that we were just talking about? Uh, this is very unlikely to happen. Good. <laughs> um, but it's a, it's a fair point. I mean, the 
what could happen is that if there, are, if there is such activity, then this could create depointing on the spacecraft. So our pointing may not be as optimal as, as we, we plan if, if these things happen. But this, of course, we cannot predict. Yeah? This is, these are totally unpredictable events. Of course. And we also have some questions regarding the nature of the landing, um, either for Sylvain or Andrea. Um, will Rosetta glide in for a soft landing or will it be a more forceful impact? And this one is from Astro Tsukinu uh, on Twitter. No, thank you. That's fine, I can take it. Um, now Rosetta will uh, descend with a speed or a velocity similar to the one of Phila, so slightly below one meter per second when it reaches the surface. So it's walking speed, relatively small velocity. Uh, it's not designed to land, so from an energy point of view, will be a soft landing. There will not be a, a crash, but Rosetta is not designed to land, as I said, so there will be some energy dissipation because of the most likely the solar big solar panels touching the surface of the comet or the instrument booms. But for sure, Rosetta will sort of bounce and tumble on the surface of the comet, will not stick immediately to the surface of, of the comet, but will not bounce back in, in orbit. <laughs> and this links very nicely also to a, a question from uh, Lars Holm on Twitter and also a couple of other people asking um, the same question. Was landing on 67P in the original planning for the end of mission or was this something that you dreamt up in more recent months? Well, okay, um, since ever I work on Rosetta for the last 20 years, so we always thought about the end of mission but not, uh, not too seriously in the sense, we always thought of landing the spacecraft on the surface of the comet, but no single effort was ever put in, in, in designing anything like this. We just, the, the only thought we had was, we finished the mission by letting the spacecraft land on, on the surface, nothing more than that. And also another question relating to uh, touchdown. Sylvan, is there any fuel left in the tanks of Rosetta? And uh, how does this relate to what happens at impact? Well, yes, there there is uh, fuel left, and okay, it has no no impact on the on the end of mission at all. And uh, also um, from uh, from Thomas on Twitter, he would like to know about the star trackers and the safe modes that have been experienced in the past. How are we going to avoid those sorts of problems? So on the, on the star trackers, so we already had to take measures uh, for the flyover phase because we were getting very, very close and we were indeed scared that uh, if we'd cross a, a jet or whatever, then uh, things could go really bad. So we've actually tuned a few um, onboard parameters of, of the software. And uh, I must say, I uh, touch wood, uh, things have been going pretty well. We had a very bad flyover. I think it was three or four... Um, uh, days ago, or weeks ago, sorry, and uh, with these new settings and the the star trackers really, really took it. So we had we had really no issues. We lost tracking for uh, for several hours, for up to four hours, but once uh, the the polluted region was was uh, crossed, then things went very well. Then on the on the final descent, so of course these parameters will still be um, uh, active, and actually we'll also be um, disabling a few severances just to make make sure that we're just basically, basically trying to prevent um, any unwanted safe mode. Okay. And related again to this topic, um, Jonathan Amos from the BBC asks, what is the error ellipse on the landing? Well, this is about uh, 600 by 400 meters off my head. And is that something that will be refined in the coming weeks or something you really won't know until much nearer the, the, the landing time? Well, it'll be refined with the, the final orbit determination uh, once the final maneuver has taken place. So in the, in the night from the 29th to the 30th. Okay. And uh, again, another question for you guys. Um, Masanori Music asks, how, many, how much percentage confidence do you have uh, to operate Rosetta right until the planned touchdown next week? We're going to make it to the 30th. Oh, you mean... Uh, it, in, in the coming days or? Uh, in the coming, yeah, coming, days. <laughs> coming days. Okay, I mean, things, uh, I'm, I'm fairly confident now. The, the yeah, touch wood, of course. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but okay, the, the flyover phase is, is going far better than expected. We're, we're staying at 4.1 kilometers. We're not going to go down. Um, we've got two more flyovers to go. So I, I think we'll, we'll be fine. But yeah, as 
yeah, we never know. And a, a question, I think, for uh, for Claire, this one. Um, Mary Four from Twitter uh, would like to know how long will we be able to take images on the way down and send them back before touchdown? Well, okay, the, the, the plan is to uh, be able to go uh, as low as possible and to transmit as late as possible. Uh, if I remember correctly, I think the the camera is uh, still focused until a couple of tens of meters before uh, before the touchdown but then you have of course to account for the time to transmit the data afterwards so uh, i would say we will really aim to have an image as close as possible uh, so it would be of the order of tens to 100 meters i would say excellent and another question now uh, back to sylvan I think, how will you make sure Rosetta stays on the comet after the impact? Okay, well, as, uh, as Andrea explained, the, um, uh, once we're arriving at walking speed, so um, basically the, the spacecraft will, will stay there once it's um, uh, impacted with, with the comet. And also at impact, uh, we'll have um, surveillances trigger because things will be unexpected, of course, and this will, will, will just passivate the spacecraft. And another uh, another question here from uh, from Graham from the blog. How can you control the spacecraft uh, so well with the forty minute time delay that you're dealing with? Okay, so, well, this is um, actually what we do in, in every day. Uh, you cannot uh, control in live if you want a spacecraft which is so far away. So you pre-program everything on board. All the all the commands are are, are sent on board. Um, hours or days in advance and this is what has been ongoing on the Rosetta mission since it has been launched. So right now we're about 40 minutes propagation delay so indeed this is, this is quite big. It takes an hour and 20 to, to know if uh, an instruction you've sent has uh, been executed properly. You cannot do anything in, in real time and this is how we will proceed as well on the, on the 30th. Most of the commands uh, will be uplinked in the, the, the previous day or even the day before. So in fact the, the mission will end but we won't actually know about it until 40 minutes after it's happened. Um, Andrea, talk us through what we will be seeing on the screen now. I remember very clearly how things looked on the, the day that Rosetta woke up from hibernation. We were watching out for a signal rising on the screen. Is it going to be the opposite to this or should we be looking out for something else? Yeah, more or less is, is, is the opposite. But as uh, Claire said as well, we are desperately waiting for the last scientific data coming down from Rosetta. That's also I would say the main reason why we do this we, is a unique opportunity to observe the comet from very, very close distances. Uh, instruments like Rosina will be able to sniff the environment around the comet from a few hundred meters, so it's a unique opportunity. Uh, Osiris, the camera as well, will have uh, resolution in the images, which is fantastic. As Larry was saying, we, will be we should be able to look into these pits, to look into the internal structure of the comet. But the final minutes, when at a certain stage, we'll simply be looking at the radio signal picked up by our uh, spectral analyzers. And once this disappears, then we will know that's the end of the mission for the flight part. And of course, the science continues, uh, as we yeah, mentioned yeah. before. But um, some, uh, some interested uh, viewers wanting to know more about why we passivate uh, a spacecraft. Maybe you can talk around what that really means. Like, why do we have to switch off the spacecraft and not attempt to operate it from the surface? Should that have been possible? Okay. Well, there's uh, the, one of the first things is there are some some regulations where which force us to switch off the transmitter uh, once the the mission is over. And uh, so this is uh, one of our our key drivers. And also, as Andrea was explaining, the, the, the spacecraft has not meant, was not designed to land. So once we have landed, there's absolutely no chance to, to be able to communicate with Earth anymore. Uh, just to give you an example, if the Huygen antenna is uh, off pointing by more than half a degree, then there's no communication possible anymore. So there's really, really no chance once we're, we're there on the comet to be able to continue the mission. And uh, some people imagining still that if it could remain awake on the surface, even survive another 30 plus months in hibernation, what would be the chances of it being able to wake up again when we come back near enough to the sun again? Okay, who knows? <laughs> <laughs> 
Um, can you tell us and this question from uh, from uh, from Twitter, I think, um, because the comet has such a low gravity, um, how do you, how can what, uh, is it possible to just sort of land it very softly, or um, kind of is it going to be a straight down impact, or is it going to be at an angle, so a ninety degree? Impact? Okay, well, it's going to be a. Uh, um we we'll try to try to arrive really um, and adhere to the to the to the comet, and the uh, after the the maneuver, so 14 hours before impact, we're about 30 centimeters per second, and then we're gradually pulled and um, uh, got accelerated by by the by the gravity pull. So at the end, we'll we'll be arriving at 90 centimeters per second, and from I think from from two kilometers from the surface, we're about 60 centimeters per second. So the the acceleration, the pull in the in the last. Um, tens of, of meters is quite, quite big. Um, a question again about images. Uh, maybe Claire can take this one. Um, how long do you need to turn around the last picture from receipt on Earth? Although maybe this is more of a PR question in terms of we receive an image on the ground and then how long will it be before we can share it? Claire, can you give us an idea of sort of just in general down, data downlink times? Yeah, well, I think when the the image gets on the ground, uh, there is some processing from the team part. Um, I would say it, sh it shouldn't take a lot, but uh, maybe a few minutes or so, something like this. Yeah, it was from a communications uh, PR point of view, then we're certainly aiming to be able to share as, uh, as many pieces of information as we can, be that images or other data um, working as closely as uh, working closely with the different instrument teams that are involved. So I hope that answers again another question from um, Jonathan Amos. Um, let's see, more questions from uh, from uh, Twitter. This one about Philae. Larry, perhaps you can take this one. Um, why have there been no further attempts to contact Philae? Well, I mean, I think the, the in reality, the, we had a lot of contacts with uh, Philae last year. When, uh, we, we got initial contact on, in June uh, and then the final contact in, in July, July 9th. So we had a number of contacts, but already we could see that Philae itself as a, uh, as a, as a, as a little, let's say, robot on the surface was having hardware problems. Uh, and indeed, the, in the last contact, we saw that the transmitter uh, functioned only because it, it managed to get, get, get around a short circuit which it was having. Um, so in reality, the, the, we, we spent a lot of time um, Flying orbits, very much flying in the same, in the same location, let's say in spaces, uh, uh, visibility location, as we had during the uh, first science sequence when Philly had just landed. We flew those orbits for a number of weeks, uh, even well after July, July 9th, when was the last uh, contact, and we got no further contact. So I think, in reality, although we know where it is now, it, it very much confirms uh, where we believed it to be. Uh, but Philly itself is the, is the key. It's, uh, it's in a location which is very much uh, shadowed. It has always been shadowed. It's a uh, you know, rock in a hard place, as they say, between a cliff, a large rock in front. Uh, the sun blocks it. The illumination is always going down on a daily basis. And uh, even if Philly was working perfectly, it would not work anymore just because of uh, the distance to the sun. So in reality, uh, I can say that Philly itself showed significant harbor problems just when we lost it due to short circuit. I think we were lucky to get over the short circuit uh, last time. And uh, since then, uh, I, I believe that uh, it's, it's very much has gone to sleep forever. Okay, and um, even though everyone was really captivated with the, the image that we released a couple of uh, weeks ago, um, it was obviously took a lot more than just images to, to finally pinpoint uh, where Philae was. Can you talk us through some of the, the other pieces of data that you used to, to, to finally arrive at the conclusion that Philae was in this place and you should take an image of this exact place? Yeah, sure. I mean, we're preparing a, a blog which will be released hopefully later on this week with with all the information and images, etc. But I mean, I think when we started looking looking for the lander, it was already based on uh, four key bits of information. Uh, the first one was the concert radar ellipse, which very much triangulated it on the surface. Uh, the second was the the Chiva images, the let's say the ground data, which showed us an idea of its location. We then had um, the RF um, links, let's say the the, uh, the visibility. Uh, information which told us uh, let's line a site between Rosetta and Philae. And finally, we had a, a number of candidates. And in June of last year, before we woke up, we already 
had a, a few candidates which uh, and we had a best candidate which uh, uh, pointed us more or less to uh, to uh, its position so when you take these as inputs and then we we kicked off in march of this year um a search campaign which uh, very much uh, was uh, was um involved a lot of uh, major groups of the Rosetta. It was a very much a Rosetta mission effort um, with a lot of work from fly, mock flight dynamics in, in, in all of this uh, and uh, driven also by, by Savannah as well. And we, we, we tried to come up with a strategy which would allow us to take views of this, let's say, region from different, uh, from different locations around the comet. So we wanted to image it from different views. And why do that? Well, in reality, if it's, if it's in a rock, rocky area, then rocks block the view. And so if you take pictures from different uh, locations, then you get different views of the same, uh, same location and maybe it's illuminated differently. So all the way through from March through to September, we've been imaging uh, a number of candidates and this one in particular uh, already in, in May showed us uh, something, I call it a light shining in the darkness. We already started to see something there. Uh, the resolution was improving for Osiris and we could already see the leg, for example, we thought it looked like a leg, but. It, is it a leg? That's the question, because of course you also see a lot of ice close by, which could so you have to prove it's not ice. And uh, so in the, in this campaign, we spent a lot of time trying to look at evidence. Okay. And so what other evidence did we have? Of course, we wanted to check against the, the Chiva images. It was clear. We wanted to check visibility line of sight. So we had images from Rosetta, which showed the lander, but also sometimes where it just got out of view. You compare when it's just gone out of view with uh, the RF contacts. That we had and you find also the rf contact is lost at the same point all of this information feeds into to build up the evidence and, and we had this evidence already and it was yeah very happy to get that image it's, it's the image which was a perfect uh, way of demonstrating we found it thank you and um speaking of uh, the filet landing um question that which is still very very fresh in uh, people's minds it would seem a question from zuvekan on uh, twitter after the experience of Philae landing, are there new ideas to ensure even more successful future landings? Um, maybe this one for Sylvain? Sylvain, could you unmute your microphone, please? Sorry, second time. Um, yeah, so this, I was saying this is a lessons learned exercise. We need to um, go through all what has happened and just, of course, try and improve things for uh, for uh, future missions, which are going to go and try and drop a, a lander or a rover. And another question relating to the, the presence of Philae and Rosetta on the comet um, from the same person. Will the, will the presence of the two spacecraft on the comet in, influence the orbit of the comet itself? Well, maybe I can take it. Now, for sure not the orbit of the comet, not. Uh, we observed the orbit of the comet being changed by the activity of the comet itself. So the gas emitted by the comet is actually changing the attitude of the comet, so the orientation of the spin axis, the period of the comet, and its rotation period. But for sure, the presence of Rosetta and Philae cannot affect the orbit of the comet. The, the, the ratio of masses is gigantic, and the impact is negligible for the comet itself. Sure. Um, a question here from uh, journalist Tracy Watson from USA Today. What would happen to the spacecraft if you didn't steer it into the comet? I take this one. Okay, well, we're, um, we're on our way uh, to the feeling of the orbit, so we're going further, further away from, from the sun. Uh, so already now, uh, on the instrument side, we're doing power sharing because there's not enough power to maintain all the instruments um, active all at the same time. And then, okay, in a, in, a few, in a few weeks from now, we'll not even have enough power to operate the spacecraft. Um, so basically, we're, we're running out of power. So if we did nothing, then at some point, the, uh, the, the spacecraft would just switch off. Okay. The, the main problem is that the propellant freezes. And so apart the damages, the physical damages to the instrument, but also if the propellant in the pipes freezes, then that's it. You can't operate the spacecraft anymore. Um, there's still more questions about turning off the spacecraft. Um, maybe you touched on it before, but perhaps um, there's a few more details to be shared. How do you turn off a transmitter on a spacecraft that is designed to be as fail safe and reliable as possible? Okay, well, that's a very good question. It was actually quite challenging to, to create a, a patch because indeed nothing is, spacecraft is not designed to be switched off. 
So we've had to, uh, to make a, a, a patch in-house, basically, and validate it, and uh, just to force it to uh, enter a, a branch where the, the whole spacecraft will be in standby, as it was when it was uh, being tested on ground. So we're forcing the spacecraft to enter that branch, and in that branch, um, the, the, the transmitter is off, and the, the, AOS, the AOCS, so the attitude in orbit control system is off, most of the uh, the subsystems are off. So this is what we do, but indeed it was it was challenging to uh, to make this patch. There's a lot of people wondering not only about the 30th of September, but also beyond that. And um, Maru Maru uh, sorry Marco Maruzzi asks from a future astronomer, you were the first to land on a comet, paving the way for such great missions. How does that feel? Great. <laughs> <laughs> I enjoyed it. It was the best thing I could do in my professional life, definitely. Yeah, it was a, an honor to, to work on this mission, there's, there's no doubt. And uh, on a similar theme, uh, Tyler Waldrop asks, what will everybody be working on next? We're all retiring. <laughs> <laughs> Holiday. <laughs> yeah, I'll take holiday, I think. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> There's still obviously a lot to do for. I mean, I think the uh, there's there's different uh, answers. I mean, uh, it's it's clear that uh, that we have a lot of missions uh, still within the agency which uh, we'll all be assigned to. Um, but Rosetta itself, uh, although the, the flight operations will end, it, it it's not the end of Rosetta because there's a lot of uh, activities in the next three years after uh, after operations finish where we, we we try to gather all the data, we try to put it in the best form which can be make it uh, accessible to the general public from the archive. And we, we try to put a legacy in place which will allow this data to be used for for the next cometary mission, whether it's uh, 10, 20, 30, 40, whatever, 100 years from now. Uh, and you can see how important this data is because uh, just recently we've had a conference between where Giotto data was used. I mean, Giotto from 30 years ago. This data was fed in, comparing it to Rosetta. So I think we can look forward to, to uh, many years from now where the Rosetta data will be compared to other satellites, and I'm sure it'll be, uh, it, it's quite unique with that as data, and it's, it's very special, it's very special data. Yeah, speaking of which, um, there's already a, a great image archive with all of the navigation camera images, and these have the very latest uh, images up to, I think, uh, a month or six weeks ago. Tell us about some of, well, well that archive for sure, but also maybe some of the, the other instruments, uh, data, and how people can, um, can access those, and how scientists can access those. I mean, the, the, the Rosetta archive is there, it's a planetary science archive, and we, we um, clearly the images have the most, uh, let's say, public attraction. And um, we spent a lot of effort trying to set up this image browser to allow people to look at the, not only the NavCam, but also the Osiris images. And we'll continue to populate that in the, in, all the way through to, uh, let's say, the end emission images. Um, but in parallel, we, we're, of course, um, building up the planetary science archive, uh, improving the interfaces to be able to look at at, uh, at these images, but also to look at maps of, of data, whether it's infrared or, or whether it's ALICE, uh, which is uh, ultraviolet, all these maps in, maps of data of the comet, which uh, are very much unique, or even the Rosina spectrometer, spectro spectrometer data, uh, it's, uh, it's, it's a treasure trove of, of data, uh, giving, uh, it's, and it's so varied because we, it's like a flying laboratory. You have so much different data from so many different instruments, uh, uh, whether it's the plasma data, which all of, has different ways of interpretation and, uh, and coming up with interfaces to it is, is, uh, is very challenging but uh, yeah we're uh, we're very much focused in the in the post operations phase to to uh, improve the interfaces and and uh, allow people to to use that data to its maximum thanks and just a reminder for people who might be joining the live broadcast now please uh, feel free to ask us questions both in the comments box um, here in YouTube Live and also via Twitter using the hashtag AskESA. A um, couple more questions here, I think, for the operations team at ESOC. Are there similar missions planned like Rosetta and Philae? Well, unfortunately not on one side, I would say, but we, have, we are planning different missions. Uh, we are uh, flying to Mars, so ExoMars is arriving, reaching Mars in a month from now, 19th of October. We have the orbit insertion and the demonstration landing. We're preparing a rover in four years from now. We're preparing missions to fly to the sun, to Mercury, to Jupiter. So we are still exploring our solar system. 
I find it a bit a pity that we are not preparing for a comet sample return mission, definitely. But on the other side, there's much more to explore. It's not only comets. For sure. And in fact, that answers another question that uh, Masonary Music had, which was to all of the participants of the Hangout, including myself, which mission are we joining after Rosetta? And in fact, there were, you know, 20 something space science missions in varying uh, degrees of whether it's still in the test center here, planning future missions and for sure will be um, the communications team that works on Rosetta will for sure be back at ESOC just a few weeks later to support the arrival of, uh, of ExoMars and ExoMars landing. So it's a very busy time at ESA beyond just Rosetta. Um, a question here, another good one uh, from our Twitter followers, would landing on a different comet be very different or is any comet just a comet? What do we think about that? Well, uh, I, I would say every comet is different. Uh, look at the shape of this one. We were expecting something totally different and the shape poses us challenges. Uh, there are comets which are far less active They're, then they are not so interesting from a scientific point of view. Maybe it's easier to land on them. There are comets that are much more active, so maybe more interesting from a scientific point of view, but much more difficult to land on. So every comet I think is different. So not the same landing on another comet. I, I can add as well, maybe, to, to say that, I mean, that the Philae, for example, was designed to, to land on, on Comet Vertanen. And when we changed Comet, then in the end, uh, uh, Churma was was slightly bigger, it has a greater mass, so therefore its gravity pull is greater and the, and the impact would be greater. So they had to uh, uh, reinforce uh, the, the, the structure of the lander to be able to land on this different comet. So clearly, uh, yeah, the mass has a, has, a, has a lot to say with how, how landing uh, can be done on the comet. There's a question here triggered, I think, by the, the talk of the archive, Larry. Um, how do you archive all the data and make it useful to researchers in 40 years? And um, Zabakuin on Twitter says he can't use floppy disks anymore. <laughs> I don't have floppy disks myself, so that's okay. I mean, I think the, the, there is no doubt when you're, when you're uh, dealing with archiving, it's... It, it's it's clear that that you have to have the future in mind and and, and also be uh, at the forefront and in, in technologies and how the data and access is, is being used uh, the structure of the data is 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 always in a very particular form it's in a pds format uh, uh, which is uh, is very particular and and has certainly is challenging for the instrument teams to deliver in that format uh, but even still we're, we're working uh, with what's called pds3 uh, and yet uh, all the new missions are working on pds4 uh, so we have to look to evolve the, the data when it's in the archive to this new format. And there's no doubt as, as time passes, uh, then we'll have to evolve again. The, the idea is always to keep as close as possible to, uh, uh, to, the, to the, the data access format that exists in the world. And uh, uh, it's a challenge, but uh, yeah, it's, it's an important challenge that you have to meet to keep the data accessible. Sure. And um, back to the, the topic of lessons learned and, and future missions. Um, Jean McCulker asks, has there been much sort of crossover discussion between the Rosetta teams and the Osiris Rex teams re-landing on small bodies? Um, I'm not sure who would like to answer that question. Okay. I'm not aware of it, no. I mean, there's a lot of lessons learned from Rosetta, definitely. And I think we are at least using our experience from Rosetta for future uh, missions. Uh, there's a lot of uh, knowledge transfer from uh, missions like Rosetta to missions, future missions like Baby Colombo or Juice. Uh, but for Zeris Flex, I'm not, I'm not aware of it. Okay. Um, but Claire, while you're talking, there's a question here for you um, from Carl Tremon on Twitter. At what height from the comet do you expect the last image that we receive to be taken? Well, I think it's going to be uh, less than 100 meters. But uh, the exact, the exact uh, uh, eight, eight, I would say, uh, we are not completely sure first because uh, we have an uncertainty also b about the landing time. Uh, and uh, basically also we, we have to, uh, to see uh, how long does it take then to, uh, to transmit the image. But uh, the main uncertainty I would say is uh, really on the when will be the, the touchdown point. So. Mm -hmm. But they will, uh, of course, they will. The Osiris team, the image team, will target to uh, to have the the last images uh, as close as possible transmitted to to Earth. Yeah, I mean, there's a there's a strategy currently being defined with 
with Sylvan's team and also with Osiris to try to uh, uh, define, to get clearer to the Osiris team exactly what is the more or less um, the final touchdown time. And this will uh, will, will involve then a, 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 let's say a recalculation of the of the times at which images are taken, all with the the real aim to to get this uh, final close to surface image. It's uh, it's led therefore by the timing, but also led by by um, by the resolution of Osiris, because of course it has two cameras, and uh, the closer you get, then uh, someone goes out of focus, and, and so it's 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 uh, it's I, I think I think certainly there will be. Uh, some very, very close up images, and we're all looking forward to seeing them. Just, just, and talk to us. No, go ahead. Sorry, Claire. Just, just to compliment on this the, the objective of Osiris is to get a 15 meter, so one five meter image from the surface and transmit it back to, to Earth. Yeah, so, okay, let's see if that's possible. <laughs> and on that theme, uh, somebody just asked um, if you were going to look into the matte pits, which are naturally dark. How will we get enough light to be able to take a photo? I can have a go. Yeah, well. just, um, no, just uh, I, I mean, one of the uh, so can we see in the darkness? I think that's maybe the the the, the question. And I think the perfect example is if you look at the Philly image that was released on the second of September. Philly was in the darkness, and yet the image looks very bright. So I think there's a lot of Osiris well, itself has a has a very wide dynamic range, and certainly they'll they, they make use of that. Anything else? No, no, I think it's. Uh... And we're also uh, adapting the, the pointing such that we get different illumination conditions to try and, of course, guarantee uh, some illuminated images of the pits all, all the way down. Okay. And um, there's a question here from, uh, from, from Daniel via the Ask ESA hashtag. How do we get the signals to, to ESOC in the first place? They don't, they don't just magically appear there on your screen, but they go through ground stations. Tell us how. Tell us about this and what the, this happens on the day. Yeah, indeed. So, um, okay, on, on, for those special events, we'll have a double station coverage because we just need to make sure we have a, a station. Uh, station issues do happen. And our prime uh, stations will be the 70 meter dishes from, the, from the, the DSN, so the American stations, because they're much bigger, so they provide a much higher uh, downlink rate. And we're interested in getting the, the, the biggest uh, amount of signs possible. Uh, so the, the, the last station will normally be the 70 meter in Madrid and the one before in Canberra. And we have uh, our stations, our, our ESA stations as, as backup. So um, more generally, we have stations all around the world. And uh, at any given point in time, we're, we're connected from here, from Darmstadt to that station. And then that station is in contact with the, the spacecraft, both uh, uplink, so t sending commands to the spacecraft and on the downlink, so receiving science and telemetry from the spacecraft. Super. And uh, you've, uh, well, the mission in general has uh, inspired a lot, of, uh, a, lot of, a lot of people and a lot of young people in particular. There's a question here asking, how do you get to become an engineer or a spacecraft operator at ESA? You keep dreaming. <laughs> just uh, the best job in the world. Just uh, apply to the, the open positions. There's also many companies working with us and uh, so there are many opportunities so if it's your dream just just go for it i think that's good advice and uh, that sort of reminds me to remind uh, the viewers if they if you haven't already heard of our rosetta legacy project um this is an archive that we're collecting of the different ways that people have become inspired by the mission and we've been really overwhelmed with uh, beautiful entries ranging from the way in which maybe teachers have brought the mission into their classrooms to inspire young people, whether it's a small baking project in the kitchen at home, but right the way across the spectrum to people being inspired to change their careers or make new study choices or even name their pets or children after different elements of the Rosetta mission. So for the team, it's a really nice, uh, for you guys, it's a really, could be a really nice way to see how your mission has and how your work has influenced. And for members of viewers who are watching and you haven't seen it yet and you would like to contribute, then please do check out the Rosetta Legacy project on Tumblr. And for we're picking a few uh, entries each week um, to win one of these uh, Rosetta and Philo plush toys that you can see behind us. So do check that out if you haven't already. OK, back to uh, the questions from Twitter. And there's one here, very big question. What did we learn from the Rosetta mission? I think that we've all learned something from it. Um, ESOC, 
Do you have any, what kind of key things did you learn from an operations point of view? Well, for me, we've learned that big projects pay off. Rosetta is paying off dramatically. This project was conceived 30 years ago. It's been a massive investment, a massive risk, but also a massive success. Uh, this is in general, from an operations point of view, we've done something completely new. We've uh, come to the limit of our capabilities, our technologies. We have to develop something new, something that nobody else had ever done. So we are on the le leading edge of, of, this, uh, of these capabilities in the world. And there are other centers learning from us on how to do operations in proximity of small bodies. So this is definitely something we have learned and we are mastering. So this is from an operations point of view. Then in premise, we did this, uh, this mission for scientific purposes. So I'll leave it to, to Claire and, and Larry maybe to comment on this. Well, from a scientific point of view, I mean, there's, from a scientific point of view, there's a lot of results already, uh, tremendous results from Rosetta. Uh, but I would say that really, I think it's only the beginning at the moment. The, um, as, um, as Andrea was saying, it will take decades to really uh, look at the data in details and, uh, and get uh, all the information out of it. But we've learned a lot about uh, where or under which condition the, the nucleus formed. We've learned a lot, a lot about the nucleus interior, which was really a, a fantastic results from the, the concert instrument. Uh, we've learned so many things. I mean, uh, the, how this, uh, this uh, bilobe uh, nucleus formed, um, under which process. Uh, I mean, we couldn't really list them all now here, but uh, we've, we've learned a lot. But uh, again, I think it's, it's only the beginning. And I uh, would just add on a, let's say, human point of view. We've also learned a lot. It's a huge project. It's been a hell of a lot of... Uh, uh, iterations, discussions, conflict resolutions, and um, compromise, compromise from the teams and so on. So uh, I think it's, it's also a fantastic success in that respect. I don't know if you want to add anything. No, I think, I mean, I think there's no doubt that Rosetta itself had a, had a goal in mind and a major goal, which was to, to rendezvous with a comet and far from the sun, watch it wake up understand how it's waking up, watch its processes, its chemical, and it's, it's uh, let's say, the process in which it produced the gas and dust, try to understand more about its formation, uh, and follow that comet through its uh, orbit around the sun, and then watch it, let's say, die down again. And and uh, uh, did we meet that goal? Well, I think we met it just uh, overwhelmingly, did we make that goal? And I think Rosetta has just uh, astounded the scientists with what we've managed to find out, and it's it's uh, as, as Claire said, it's only the beginning. This data that there is, how much has been extracted is we've learned so much, and yet there's so much yet to uh, to extract from it. Uh, I think it's going to be very. Uh, I think the the results from Rosetta will will take many years uh, to, to to stop coming out. It's an interesting question because lots of people are asking, you know, what are the the top science results from the mission? And in fact, it's it's interesting because if you ask, depending on who you ask, you get a different answer. Of course, if you ask somebody whose area of expertise is comet dust, then they might tell you they were, I think the most amazing result is, you know, how the different morphologies of the dust grains and that even when you get down to really, really small sizes, the dust grains are still made of smaller and smaller pieces and this really ties into the evolution of the comet. And then you might talk to a scientist whose speciality is uh, coma gases, for example, and then you, we immediately have all the exciting discoveries of um, nitrogen, oxygen, all of the things that, that tell us about the very uh, way in which the, again, the, the, the temperature conditions in which the, the comet formed very early in the solar system. And of course, we mentioned, uh, Claire, you mentioned the comet shape. It seems likely that these two bits of, uh, of comet were once two comets that joined together in the past. And all of these little pieces are coming together now to to kind of paint this picture of the comet's evolution. And there are a couple of people also wanting to know, you know, will there be a big scientific paper with all of these results? I mean, of course, there's lots of scientific papers already covering all the different aspects of these results. And um, you can catch up on, on already uh, two years worth of science if you've missed it via the Rosetta blog, blogs.esa.in forward slash Rosetta, and of course, esa.in forward slash Rosetta as well. And for uh, people who would, uh, people who are watching who would like to know more about the science highlights, then you can join us on 
the 29th and the 30th of September as well, when we will have a live stream from ESOC covering not only the final hours of Rosetta's descent, but also exactly these questions, what uh, science uh, we have learned from Rosetta, really. And uh, relating to the blog, I have a question which is uh, to me, how long will the Rosetta blog be operated after the impact? Well, I think it's safe to say that we will keep the blog and various social media channels open for at least a few months afterwards. And of course, even though the operations will be finishing on Rosetta, which means that the ESA Rosetta uh, Twitter spacecraft will not be able to communicate anymore, we will, of course, have a lot of science still to report, which people will be able to follow on Twitter via ESA Science, via the Rosetta blog, and via the main ESA website as normal. OK, so we are coming almost to the end. And I want to ask each of our guests, what were their main highlights from the entire mission? We've talked a bit about some of the specific highlights of operating the mission, but were there any events that particularly stick out in your mind? And maybe you'd like to, to tell the viewers also how long you've been working on the Rosetta project for. Should I start? Go for it. OK, I've been working for Rosetta in January next year will be exactly 20 years, not full time, but this will be 20 years elapsed time. Um, for me personally, emotionally, the highlight was the hibernation exit. For me, that day was a binary thing. Either we had a mission or we had no mission at all. So this was the highlight. Technically, for my specific job, I think the time we arrived at the comet in August 2014, and within six weeks, we were capable of orbiting the comet. This technically, for our own job, has been the first masterpiece. There were many other, and what we are doing, what they are doing right now, is even more difficult than that. But these are the highlights for me. Okay, um, I joined in 2001. So, Van, you've muted yourself again. Sorry, so three times. Time. Never two without three, yeah? So. <laughs> Um, so I, was, I joined in 2001, but I wasn't there continuously. Um, from an operations point of view, the, the, the mission has just been amazing and fantastic because it was, it was never routine, it was always changing, there was always something new. So Andrea quoted the hibernation entry and exit, and that, that was for sure a key. But also, we also did two asteroid flybys. This was the, the first time we did this in Europe, and this was also uh, amazing uh, phases to work on and then all, all the phases since, uh, since we've landed. So I, will, I cannot really quote one, one single event on my end. Larry and Claire, what were your highlights? Mm -hmm. OK. Um, well, so I've been working on Rosetta for almost 10 years, I think, now. So uh, for me also, it's a very, very long time. Um, I don't know. I think if I have to really uh, remember one specific uh, event, I would say it's really when the shape of the comet uh, uh, appeared to us. So that was uh, in summer 2014, as uh, Andrea was saying. And I think it was, uh, if not a shock, at least a big surprise to see such a complex uh, morphology and structure of, uh, of, the, uh, of the surface. So yeah, it was uh, all challenging and, uh, and a bit scary at the same time. Uh, but this is really, I think, what I will keep as one of my main memory of the, of the mission. Okay, and, and myself, I mean, I've been, you know, I've been working on Rosetta. I worked on Rosetta already from 2000. I was uh, working with Sylvan and Andrea in, in ISOC for, for up to launch. Uh, and then I moved away and I came back again about five years, uh, five years ago. So certainly about uh, nine years or so on the mission. Um, my highlights, I mean, I think it's, it's uh, I've never come across like a mission like Rosetta. And I've worked about five different missions and never come across anything like it to, for the highs it can give. There's a, it's quite a, uh, I, I, I pick out a few in, in principle. I think I totally agree with Andrea. I think the, the getting that signal to know we had a mission was so, was so important uh, because it was very much, everything was so central to, to having a mission on, on, on getting that signal. Uh, the Philly landing was, was extraordinary for me. Uh, uh, I, I think it was, uh, it, was, it was so unique and, and uh, so, so special uh, and even the most recent uh, high I've had was the uh, was seeing that that picture on a Sunday night at 11:30, which was uh, two weeks ago, um, of of the fillet on the surface, having searched for it for uh, already since March, 
it was uh it was uh, it was like drinking a bucket of adrenaline basically i couldn't sleep for the whole night so uh, it was it was extreme uh, uh but it's so so uh, so rewarding uh and and i felt so happy not only for myself but all of us who were who were working for so long on this mission to to try to extract the most science but also to to try to uh to um uh, close out things and one of these things was was filling uh, finding fill in the surface i think was was uh, certainly the bonus we needed before the, the final countdown and we're now entered the final countdown and yeah it was a, a good highlight for me too because it was uh, actually my birthday so it was a great birthday present from the mission to finally find Gile. Um and for all of us actually working in the science and operations communications teams um, it's been a real pleasure to be able to work alongside all of the Rosetta mission experts the instrument teams to help share this incredible story with the with the public and to be along there at the key moments from the wake up moment as well. I mean, uh, for you and for everybody, there wouldn't have been a mission if we hadn't have woken up, if Rosetta hadn't have woken up, and neither would we have had the ESA Rosetta Twitter account either. So I was very happy about that as well. Um, stay tuned to everybody uh, who is watching now. We will have more live streaming for you on the 29th and the 30th of September. As, um, as Rosetta uh, makes the final descent to the comet's surface. Current impact time is expected, the confirmation is expected, I understand, 1320 local CEST time in uh, ESOC, and we will let you know if there are any updates to that um, as we get closer to the date. Thank you very much to, uh, to Andrea, to Sylvain, to Larry, and to Claire for joining me today to this Hangout, even though I know it's an incredibly busy time. Thank you for the viewers um, for watching. You can watch a replay afterwards if you joined late. And we will see you next week for Rosetta's final adventure. On behalf of the European Space Agency, I'm Emily Baldwin. <laughs>